So we're starting a new quarter, right? For some reason, I seem to draw that card to open the quarter up. <clears throat> and our quarter lessons this week, this, this quarter is going to be what? Mark, Mark right? The book of Mark. Well, our quarterly starts off talking about who the author of the book is. And quite frankly, it's a tradition of man who the author is. We presume Mark for a couple of reasons. But I'm going to follow in the tradition of Scripture and talk about the author as much as the book does. We're not. So we're going to talk about the book. So you all know, mostly, that I'm of a scientific background. I'm an engineer. Have you ever heard of a, an equation called a fractal? Yes. No. Yes. Let me pull up a picture for you of what fractals look like when you plot them out. They're very beautiful. Can you see that? Now, fractals have an equation that's fairly simple. It's um, x equals log of some other variable, d, divided by the log of s. It's not a really complicated equation. But what's fascinating about fractals is they don't have a scale. You look at the fractal image, and then you take a smaller section of it and look at it again, and it's the same image. You look at it again at a smaller scale, it's the same image. Or you go back and scale. You, you zoom out, it's the same image. There's a, lot of things that they, there's a lot of things in nature that have that. The coastline, for example, has that kind of, kind of pattern. Well, the reason I bring that up is I see a pattern, a fractal pattern in the Gospels in that If you look at all three or four, four Gospels, they, have, they tell a story. And then you break down and get into one book, and it tells a story too, but it has details that the other ones didn't seem to have, but it's still there. And then you break down that book into other sections, and it just keeps breaking down, but it keeps telling the same story, right? So for example, um, what's interesting about the book of Matthew, it's focused towards who? The Jews, right? And it's, I would say, primary macro objective is to establish the authentic, authenticity, 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 forget it. Authenticity. There we go. See, I knew you all would help me out. Of, uh, I'm an engineer, not a linguist. Um, of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, right? Okay. Um, and that's bookended by the Gospels, four Gospels bookended by John, right? And John, the book of John, also is focused towards the Jews. But what is his objective? Well, I guess one way you could call John, the book of John, is you could call it the book of the I Am. Right? There's seven I am's in the book of John. And so John is establishing Christ as, in the Jewish mind, as God. Not just the Messiah, but as God. And then we get to the two inner books, if you want to call it, Mark and Luke. And they're focused towards who? Jesus. The Gentiles. Right? That message is to the Gentiles. Right? And Luke is talking to the Greeks, and Greeks love gods, little g. And what Luke focuses on is that this man, Jesus, is also God, the man God. And so then we come to Mark, and Mark being focused towards the Greeks, 
which is a unique idea that he brings to that, that this God, this man God, is a servant God, right? So that is, and, and to the Greek mind, that's, uh, that's a bit, bit troubling to have this almighty God be, be a servant God. And so that's kind of the, and so now as we dig down into Mark, the principle I want you to take is this idea of the fractal. As we, as we look at bits and pieces, place those bits and pieces in the bigger story. Because there's little snippets of stories that when I grew up, you know, I'd, we'd read about this one little story of, um, and, and, and then, but it wasn't put in context of the other stories. And it turns out you put them in context of the stories. So take, for example, the, the, the parable of, in, in, uh, of the ten virgins. Well, that was also told with this parable of the talents. And to get the entire message, you need to have both parables told together. So with Mark, let's go actually to the beginning of the book and let's read some of the first sections of Mark, chapter 1. And let's see what we can dig out of, of this book. I think it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And it's interesting, and, and Rao mentioned that you know, Mark is, is, hits pretty fast and furious and is, is an executive summary, so to speak. So let's start in the beginning of the book. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way, to the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. How familiar is this story to you? Cat caught your tongue? Pretty familiar, right? We've read this story over and over and over again. John didn't eat grasshoppers. Well, I know that that offends our sensibilities of... Locust meat. Uh, yeah, we'll get there. But who is John the Baptist? Well, what is what role is John the John playing? So there was a there's a prophecy, right, of of one coming to prepare the way of the Lord, right? Where was that prophecy? Well, there's certainly Isaiah, right? Um, there's there's the reference to Elijah, right? And some, even today, I think the, our Jewish friends are still looking for Elijah to come, right? But did Elijah, has Elijah come? And did, is, that a, is that a guess or is that a definitive statement? Jesus said it. Oh, I think, didn't Jesus refer to John the Baptist as Elijah? Um, yeah, so... We certainly look at 
an, an, a corroborating text in um, Matthew, I think it's chapter 3. Let's take a look at that just so we can see that. So uh, chapter, yeah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who spoke... For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. So the book of Matthew assigns, you know, attributes this prophecy to John the Baptist. And um, if we go over to Matthew 11, uh, yeah, chapter 11, starting again in verse 1. If we wanted to go, we can read on through verse 14. But this is, this is Jesus talking about John the Baptist. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what, you did go out to, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who, who will prepare your way before you. So, certainly Matthew corroborates it in his own words. And then, quoting Christ... John the Baptist is Elijah. Yeah, Matthew 12, 11, 14. Right. Yep. Yeah. So. so there's no question about John the Baptist being Elijah. <clears throat> so another principle probably of Scripture is that I've started to discover is there's no wasted words. I don't think there's a lot of just literary flowers sprinkled about growing in, growing in the scripture. And so what is this about? It's, it, it, what is it about um, John's message that is, um, you know, what, what's the essence of John's message? Richard. Get ready. God, Jesus is coming. Get ready. Make yourself right. Well, he says certainly repent, right? Yeah. Um, can, you, uh, <clears throat> can you repent relative, relatively? Or do you have to repent absolutely? So repentance implies, I think the word in, it means to, what, turn around? So if that means if you're, you're going in one direction, you've got to turn around and go the other direction. So what's telling you the direction? What? God's law, Holy Spirit. Okay, possibly the law. Anything else? There's a standard, right? There's a standard, there's a map, there's a course, there's a compass that's pointing the direction, and you're saying you're not going to that. Go the other direction. So that's John's message, right? Repent. Why? I think, John, your sermon today is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope, I, hope not, I don't steal your thunder. <laughs> okay, let's go. It's, it's a good repetition. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hey, Ben. When we say repent, why was John asking the, who was he asking to repent? He was talking to the Jews, wasn't he? I mean, was he talking to the common people of the Jewish kingdom of Israel or the leadership? Well, what did Scripture say? What is, who, came out, who came out from, from Jerusalem? 
all. Mm -hmm. Right? So I don't think he was very selective, was he, in who he directed his message to? <clears throat> so there's certainly the message of the law, right? But what was, his, what was John's message? It's interesting, he's, he's, he's got a limited message, doesn't he? So it's a baptism of presence, because we know it's, we know it's limit, limited, because he says, I, what do you say? I, I baptize you in water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Spirit. And actually, if we look into what's interesting is that Jesus doesn't just baptize only in the Spirit. So if we go down to verse 14 of Mark 1, it says, Now after John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, quote, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He's teaching two things, right? Repent and believe in the gospel. And John <clears throat> equates that with, um, I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Spirit. So somehow this, John's equating the, the kingdom of the, the message of the gospel is the Baptism of the Spirit. <clears throat> it's the Holy Spirit that convicts the heart. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say. You know, we have to consider, you know, where are these people coming from, and they're very familiar with the law. Mm. They're very good at understanding how to keep the law. So outwardly, they are performing according to the law, and yet, I think John the Baptist is trying to say there's more to it, mm -hmm. and because people are they're suffering, and so John and people are flocking because they know that wow, I'm keeping this law, and yet I still am suffering. Something's still Something wrong. Something has to change, and yeah. then we see Jesus bringing that to full fruition yeah. as he says, you know, I've heard you've heard it said, don't murder, but if you hate, you know, and so that's how I see John as he's this you know merciful. Um, herald of there's something more and people are flocking to that because they're experiencing that and the Pharisees don't like it because it's harder to control the heart it's really easy to control behavior relatively yeah. speaking but obviously John is addressing a behavioral problem too because he's saying repent because obviously and and this is what I want to get into as I mentioned there's there are no wasted words in scripture so why is John why is it mentioned that John is clothed in, in hair, camel hair, with a leather belt, and that he eats locusts and honey? I mean, and every, every gospel points that out. I think, for, so first, first off, the, the clothing metaphor, if you want to call it that, references back to, to Elijah, the Elijah message, right? And what was the Elijah message back in time of old for Israel's time? What was, what was the status of the kingdom at that time that Elijah was, was asked to go give this message? Fully apostate. And so <clears throat> Elijah's message was a message of judgment, right? So... <clears throat> And, and John the Baptist here is, <clears throat> I would say, in that same spirit. It's a message of judgment. And judgment comes with a, again, back to the standard. Here's the standard, and you're not meeting it. Now, that message doesn't do much to how do I get back to meeting it, other than says, there's this gap between you and the, 
and the standard. And so that's what, that's what the dress at least starts to indicate. But I'd like to propose an idea. So go ahead, Peter. No, I don't want, I don't want to interrupt you. No. I, I just was, I was going to say that, that Lesson makes a good parallel between John's message and the first angel's message. There's, there's an element of judgment and prepa preparation, and it's global, like all, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of interesting. I mean, you, know, you yeah, mentioned right. judgment. That kind of reminded me of the first angel's message. Well, I think it's also, uh, John also, I think, has, is also a metaphor for Moses. Are you all tracking with me, or am I all over the place? So what's interesting is, is I've come to believe that Moses was never... If you want to believe in predestination, Moses was predestined to never go into the promised land. And I say that as a, you know, and because Moses encapsulates this, this meta-narrative of, of the law, right? When we talk about Moses, Moses is the law giver. Moses is able to bring the children of Israel up to what point? The Jordan, right? The Jordan River. And by the way, the Jordan River where John the Baptist is baptizing is I lined right in here. The promised land. Right. All Moses could do is get up to a high mountain and peer into the promised land. He could see the hope of entering into God's rest, but the law will never take you there. In and of itself, the law will only, will, can never take you there. What takes you into the promised land? I understand that Moses is a type of Christ and not John the Baptist, and that he was predestined, like Jesus, to lead them all the way. And there was the gospel. He was preaching the gospel in the law, the sanctuary service. There was no greater preacher of the gospel but in and of itself, Moses, as the law, could not take them into the promised land. Well, if you, if you limit it to the law, but he was preaching the gospel, just like I, I, Elijah. I, I, I understand right? that. But, the, but in the whole meta narrative of the scripture, again, backing up here, who took them into the promised land? Joshua. 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 Jesus. God took them in, right? Christ took them in. And he took them across the Jordan. And if you recall that story, what was the first thing to cross, the, to step into the Jordan? The law. The law went with them. But it was Jesus that took them in. So there's this, there's this multi-layer development of how we, we enter into God's rest, enter into that land of promise. Right? And so... John the Baptist here in Mark is kind of doing that same thing, isn't he? He's calling people out, holding them to a standard and saying, you're not meeting it. But John says, look, I can only take you so far. I'm baptizing you by water in the Jordan, but I can't take you into the promised land. Someone else is going to come, but I have to, this path is paved. We, the law is not done away with. But the law is put in its right place. Right? And that's, it, I think, the message of John the Baptist. Another way, maybe his clothing. Um, again, this is probably... I don't have a lot, a real, I would say, strong 100% proof of this, but I'm going to extend some metaphors. But what does clothing represent in Scripture? Character, Character righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. Christ's righteousness, robe of righteousness. Um, and our righteousness is what? As filthy rags? You know, so clothing, this clothing uh, metaphor goes along. Well, what was John wearing? Rough clothing. Clothing made by, from what? Hair. Camel hair. Is camel a clean animal? Unclean. 
No, it's not. It's interesting. I was very fascinated. I said, why camel? So I went and did a little research on the camel. Okay. And what they use to make clothes, they, they, first they don't shear the camel. It's, a, it's the f fine fiber of the hair that they collected. So it's the, under, the undercoat? I'm sorry, yes. The undercoat. Yes. And this is how his garment, I have seen pictures with the rugged uh, yeah, coat, the but skin. it's not. It's the most fine uh, garment made of this fine uh, camel, camel hair. But it, as Christ said, it's not soft clothing. <laughs> Like it's it's not clothing that was that looks like the king's the king's work. It's not fancy. It's not. But well, it's, it's not, practical. Well, certainly it's practical, but I think what, and I'm going to probably step out a little bit and make a, and a little bit of an analogy. What's the peanut gallery saying back there? <laughs> oh, okay. That I would suggest that the camel hair represents John's righteousness, right? It's imperfect. It's not, it's not complete. It's not, not only complete, it's not, it's not made from the wool of the lamb. Mm, right? And then it talks about what he ate. Ate locusts and honey. So, of course, <clears throat> it offends our sensibilities that somebody's gnawing on a grasshopper, right? Um, so it had to be probably something else, right? You know, the, the locust the locust beam or carob. Except the word locust in there is used only four other times in, in, in the New Testament or Scripture, and it references the bug. <laughs> I think it's whatever you're so, used to. I mean, it, I'll eat a it, cherry with worms in it, but that doesn't bother me because I was uh, brought up doing that. Yeah. But it's what you're you used to. You get a little extra protein with your fruit. Yes. Yeah, okay. Fresh protein. Uh, so. I was putting honey on the locust, so... That's right. <laughs> More... In Thailand, they deep fry them and they make them nice and crispy and eat them with a chili yeah. sauce. Yeah. They, it, they started eating it back in the Northeast where they had no protein. Yeah. It was their protein source. And I believe if you look at clean meats, locust is one of them. You're correct. In fact, the, the scriptural reference for that is Leviticus 11, <laughs> verses 20 through 23, if you want to go take a look at it. So... The locust is a clean animal. It's, it's, it's provided to eat, and they, eat, they ate it. Uh, what was that? Um, was it the Canaanite or Hittite leader, Sennacherib? And I guess on one of his stellies, the uh, relief carvings, there's his servants bringing him a shish kebab of a bunch of locusts on it. So it was, it was, it was a practice back, in, back at that time. Going back to what you said about the law can't take you into the promised land, mm -hmm. but the law m makes you aware you need Absolutely. someone Absolutely. who can take you yeah. there. And both Moses and, and John the Baptist make that linkage. So what I, what I don't know is whether John actually ate locusts and honey. But I think as in the clothing metaphor, there's something in the message of what he ate. And in every example of, of locusts, other than John eating them, is in the context of what? Judgment. Judgment. So we've got, the first, we've got the first one back in Egypt, right? When the eighth plague, when those locusts just came and just chewed up all of Egypt. And you go through, and then there's, the, there's certainly in the Revelation, the locusts come out and there's judgment. Mm -hmm. So... I think in this metaphor of John the Baptist is he's, he's consuming judgment, and that's the message he's giving. he's giving. He's giving the message of judgment, the message of Elijah. Well, what about honey? What does honey have to do with this? From the bee. Another bug. <laughs> but bug spit, right? <laughs> Milk and honey. Well, there's certainly milk and honey, but I, I want to. I let's take you to Psalms 19. Psalms 19. And 
Let's look at verses 7 through 10. Psalms 19, verses 7 through 10. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. All of those references, the law of the Lord, testimony, statutes, those are all synonymous words for the same thing, yeah. the law of God. And so David here is, is equating, or at least he's saying that the law is even sweeter than honey. And my pee-picking brain speculation saying, what, what back in, in Mark 1, when John is eating honey, he's taking in the law. He's taking in the law. It's a law of judgment. My righteous, our righteousness is not sufficient to clothe us. But one is coming. It's this message of law is required, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. But one is coming that will be sufficient. And so, do you want to eat locusts and honey now? Well, I think another message here when you look at John is that uh, he was wearing the clothes and eating the meals of a poor man, of a servant. You know, and so if you're going to go out and preach the gospel, are, are you doing it for profit or are you doing it as a servant? John was clearly doing it as a servant. Well, in that spirit, you know, John says, look, you know, this one's coming after me that who I, whom I can't even untie a shoe, right? And one could look at that as, again, I'm, I'm, I may be trying to force, force things too hard and, you know, trying to stick a square peg in a round hole, but I'm going to do it. And what, that, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to see Christ in all of this, right? That's what I'm looking for. And so when John says, you look, you know, one's coming after me who I can't even, I can't even un untie a shoe. Yes, he's, he is a servant. Yes, I agree with that. He's, he's so low that he can't, you know, he's not, he's not even worthy to untie the shoe. But again, going back to Moses, where was Moses told to take his shoes off? Burning bush. Burning bush. bush, right? Why? Because it's holy ground. And, and it's holy because... That's God's ground, right? And when you wear shoes, you can walk anywhere you want to walk. And in the desert, when you take your shoes off, well, it's hot, it's sticky, it's rocks, you're not going to mow. It's holy ground. And what I think, what, I, what I'm trying to see here in John, and maybe again, I might be trying to force, force feed this a bit, but I don't think so, is that John is saying, look, even in this message of judgment, even in this message of, of law, even in this message of I don't have the righteous, I cannot, I cannot take you to holiness. We cannot get there from here. But it's necessary. Do you see the standard? Do you like the standard? Do you want the standard? And what is the prayer of the publican? That's all he asks is be merciful to me to center. He doesn't say, oh, thank you for the grace of God, go I. Yeah. Right? Be merciful to me, a sinner. And so John, in, in not able to even unloose his shoe, cannot bring us to holiness. But he says, one will. Well, I just had a thought as you're talking, you know, the law is really actually a beautiful thing. You know, the Ten Commandments is beautiful, and it's a revelation that we have a very relational God, mm -hmm. because the first five are about that relationship with Him, and the second five, or the first four, and the, mm -hmm. sec the second half, 
you know, is our relationship with yeah. our common man. And we forget that. And I think the people at that time had forgotten that and they were focused, you know, there's all these Levitical laws and they're focused on themselves, kind of like what you were just saying, instead of realizing, and then Jesus says, you know, what's the greatest law? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your fellow man. Mm-hmm. And so it's this, the law is beautiful, and we forget that Mm -hmm. if we don't understand it and view it from the place of relationship. Mm -hmm. Because what a good God we have that he wants us to have peace with him and with each other. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You can't argue with that. Mm-hmm. And yet we, we get all confused, and God mm-hmm. is so good. Mm-hmm. Riffing off that, um, how often are we told in our society we need to love each other? Or just all we need is love. What is love? How do we know what love is? We seem to all think we know what it is. We just pass this word around and we assume when when I say, you know, I love ice cream or I love my wife or, you know, we we assume we know what that means. What does it mean? I mean, so when we were, when Christ answered, what's the greatest commandment? Of course, he was quoting from Deuteronomy, but he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, right? Something you enjoy. But what does, you know, that tells us what to do but what is love? What does it mean even to love God? Well, okay. Classic Jesus, he doesn't give us the answer. He points us in a direction to go look. Just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You, you know, how many of you wished you were there walking on the road to Emmaus when Christ opened up the, the scriptures? And Well, we're told he opened up the scriptures and he pointed to where all the prophecies spoke of him. So what do we do? He didn't give us the answer. He told us where to go look for it. So this idea of what is love, when Christ says, love the Lord your God, how do we find out what love is? Well, let's go look at the law. Okay. So what's the first commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the greatest. What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other. So God is supreme, right? And that, by the way, that little God, the word God, thou shalt have no other gods before is judge, Elohim. Thou shalt have no other. No one else will establish your value other than me. God is supreme. So first and foremost, God is supreme. Do you, and so your response to that is, do I recognize God as supreme? And when I put, that in, put me in relationship with God that way, that is starting to get me on the path of what it means to love God. What's the second commandment? Now it shall make any false image, right? Okay, so that means I'm not to misrepresent God's character, right? But also, it's interesting, Paul equates covetousness with idolatry. He actually bridges both of those commandments, the least, you know, the, 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 one, the second and the greatest. Well, how is covetousness idolatry? Well, because I could... Oh, I, I, I need the latest phone, right? I, I, I lust after that. And does this phone become, become my, my idol? Is that what he's talking about? I don't think so. When I, when I see something that I want that I don't have and I covet it, I have this desire to go get it. I'm taking my own effort to go get it. I become the supplier of my own need. And the idol is not the thing. I'm the idol. I become my own God. I become my little God that I'm trying to now go meet my own needs. When God says, I have supplied you everything you need. Will you trust me for that? So that's the second commandment. What's the third commandment? Is that all the the GD words and whatever? No. In the scriptures, in in the Jewish mentality, what is a name representative of? character. So if God says, don't take my name, that implies he's given it. So he's given us the character, his character, his nature. And if you're going to take it, he says, take it seriously. 
Okay, so, so now we see this pers perspective of, of what is, this is what it means to love God, right? And then what's the fourth commandment? Sabbath. But Sabbath, but it says, now that you've got me properly placed, you haven't misrepresented me, you've taken my name and taken it seriously, what was the failure of Adam and Eve in the garden? God says, I will give you everything you need. And Adam and Eve goes, nah, we're going to do it ourselves. And so Sabbath is in the proper context of the first three commandments is that now we're going to rest and let God take care of us. Amen. Isn't that the message of the, the ordinance of humility? That the God of the, God of the universe, universe, the king of our of his kingdom, of which we're part of, is going to stoop and do the lowest job in the kingdom and wash your feet. He is both the highest and the lowest. He is the servant God. This is what Mark is talking about. He's introducing the servant God. Will you, will you let God serve you? I mean, it's not a, you, can't, you can't let the, 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 the God, if you've got him in the highest position in your mind, you can't take that position of, of, of anything other than humility to let the God of the universe serve you. Because that's what he wanted. He, he, he said, I've done this all for you. And, and even, even in salvation, he's done this for us. Um, going back to what you said about uh, Adam and Eve taking that their own, making their own decision. Uh, myself, I don't feel that's accurate. I feel that they allowed deception, control their judgment, and not use God's word to judge what was right between Satan misleading them and God's word. What do you think about that? Um, I, would, I would push back a little bit, and I would say, um, Scripture says that Eve was deceived, and Adam made a choice. Um, so... And in the, in the deception, if you want to call it that, you know, but basically, you know, Satan came in and said, hey, didn't God say you could not eat of any tree? When just prior, God's, you know, and Eve corrected him and said, no, 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 God said we could have any tree except this one. And in that, in that again, that metaphor, the trees providing food is God's meeting our needs. He's supplying all that we need. And so that's, that's where I would say that, yes, we, you know, God wants to take care of us. And are you allow, are, will you allow God to do that for you? So we move on to, to the baptism. Now, now John's done this, this, this preaching, and the response is what? He's looking for a response. And he baptizes by what? Water? And where does he baptize them? Jordan. Why the Jordan? Why do, you, why do you go all the way out to the edge of your country? You're on the borderland of the country. And John is in the wilderness, right? So I think, you know, if you kind of sketch between the lines, John has gone back to the wilderness of the wanderings. And the people come out there. They get reoriented and then they get baptized in the Jordan at the border. But he says, that's not enough. One is coming after me. Who will baptize you by the Spirit? Baptism of water. Thank you, Peter. I don't know how you picked out the words right out of my mouth. Water or Spirit. Yeah, what, is, what, is Christ, what does Christ tell Nicodemus? You have to be born by both water and the Spirit. I'm sorry. And I had, had thought at some point in my time, not too distant past, that this water was physical birth, right? You know, babies are born in water. Nope, looking at John, looking at Mark in this, in this, in John the Baptist, it's this idea that you have to be, you know, you, if you're born in water, it's you, you, have, you have seen the law, you've taken it in, you've, you've recognized your misalignment to that law, and you've repented. 
That's, the born of, that, that's being born of the water. But Jesus has advised this also. He said, look, you know, when he cast out demons, right? Cast out the spirits. He said, he cast out a demon and you put your house in order. You swept it all clean. But if you don't move something else in and it's still empty, the devil's going to come back and move in. It's going to be worse than it was before. So the sweeping out is, the, is I think, the being born of the water. Being born of the Spirit is when the Holy Spirit comes in and indwells. And I think it's what Revelation talked about is the spirit of prophecy. I may be talking some blasphemy in the Adventist church. But the spirit of prophecy that the angel's talking about, he's equating that with a testimony. The testimony is the spirit of prophecy. That testimony is a capital T. You go back to Exodus. The Ten Commandments, formal name, is called the testimony. The Ark of the Testimony. And the angel is saying, equating a spirit of prophecy with that testimony. And what's the prophecy? The prophecy is in Jeremiah 31. In that day, I will, it's God saying, write my law in your heart and in your mind. Right? Isn't, that, isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? You don't know how it happens. As Christ says, the Spirit goes wherever it will, and you, don't, you, you, don't, you, don't, you can't see the Spirit, but you can see the effect of it. Isn't that what we hope for? To have the Spirit of that prophecy fulfilled in our hearts and in our minds. This is the message, I think, that, that is, is in Mark. This is the introduction to the story as he lays it out. And as we look through this, this quarter and study this, this message, look for Christ. Amen. See Christ however you can in this book and how he has given everything to you. And what's interesting, a friend of mine pointed out to me, he says, when, what was the evidence of Christ's death on the cross? He was pierced. He was pierced. Water and blood. Water and blood came out. And I think that water was signifying his alignment with the law and his pouring out of his spirit for us. He poured out his law and he pours out his life, his spirit. It's the message of, one of the messages of the cross. Let us bow our heads. Oh. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus we come before you, Lord, to first confess that we need you. We are not in alignment with your law. But Lord, we desire to, be re to, to repent, to turn, to see in your law the beauty of your holiness. And we desire that, Lord. And so we also ask for this baptism of, of spirit. Fill us with, your, with who you are, what you are, and how you are. Write your law deep in our hearts and in our minds, down into our DNA, so that it will be in, our, in us permanently. You've promised us if we ask for good things, you will give us these things. And these, this is the very essence of, of goodness that we ask for. So we will hold you to your promise. And we look forward to having that promise fulfilled in each and every one of us today. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.